This is a story about one city with four schools so close you could cover them with a blanket. They play in a hockey tournament at a time when the sports calendar is darker than the first two Mondays in February. Circle the dates. First round the first Monday. Consolation and final the next. The schools compete. The bands battle. And somebody gets to brag. And they have been doing this for 50 years. The tournament has become a wonderful constant in an ever-changing sports world. The players, whose ages range from late teens to early 20s, are happy just to have played in it, but forever fulfilled by having won it. They are students and coaches from Boston College, Boston University, Northeastern, and Harvard. But they also played in the Beanpot, where dreams come true. When you consider the schools, the four different schools, how different they are, but how important they've been to Boston over the course of their many, many years. Harvard, the Brahmins and the founders, and Boston College, the Catholic immigrants, Northeastern, the bootstrap kids who work their way through and do it the hard way, and BU is the great melting pot. It's the most diversified student body in the entire country. They're so different, but to them, the sport of hockey is all very important. And then when they get together every year, I just envision it as Boston coming together and saying, hey world, this is what we are. Boston is a city of neighborhoods. It's a city of Connors, you know, what Connors you find? And I think the thing about the bean pot is everybody knows everybody else. They all know where they go to school. They never let you forget it, especially if you lose the thing. And they say the thing is, it's great to win the bean pot, but the most important thing is to not lose it because you'll never hear the end of it. And even if you went on to win the ECACs or Hockey East or the NCAAs, somebody was gonna say, yeah, but you didn't win the bean pot. You win that bean pot. And I don't care what kind of a year you had, if you had a very average or poor year, everyone thought you were great because you won the bean pot. The bean pot, you know, uh, it covered a, a multitude of sins in the whole year, uh, if you could win that bean pot. I can remember the butterflies today in, in anticipation of the games, and uh, would sit up if we had the second game and watch the first game, and you'd work up to it. And the next thing you knew, you were on the ice, and there were 13.909 in the, in the, in the stands. And uh, I don't think it's, it's equaled anywhere else in the world. Uh, can you come out with the dub? Nothing more, nothing less. Leave nothing to chance now. You control your destiny out here. Very good chance to work hard. Win on three. One, two, three. When you're playing in front of 14,000 people at the garden, it's sort of, it, you know, it's sort of intimidating the first time you're out on the ice and you look up and everybody's screaming and yelling. And, you know, I went there as a kid, so I know what the atmosphere is like in the stands, but to be actually beyond the ice, it's, it, it was tough to concentrate the first couple shifts. Even now in the Fleet Center, um, one of the first things that, that pops out is that it's a huge building, and, uh, and you know that the stage that you're about to go on to is bigger than, than what you're used to. It's kind of like, uh, you know, this is the show, this is Broadway. I think it's a, it's a more difficult task getting a ticket for the bean pot than getting a ticket for the World Series or the Super Bowl. It's amazing. Wow. And the rivalry is just, you know, being on ice or off ice, people like to excel when they go to battle. That's really what the whole thing's about. But it's friendly, it's competitive, and when the games are over, you're still friends. The camaraderie of going back to bean pots now and seeing guys you graduated with, players that you played with and against. It's just something that, it's a reunion of Boston. You know, we used to say back years ago, nobody knew of it outside of 128. Then it got the 495. Now it's right across the nation. Everybody talks about the bean pot at some time or another during those two weeks. That's the bean pot. That's what, a ray of hope, is it a dream? something that we get. The college hockey world was once a small one. Its meeting house was the Boston Arena on St. Patolph Street. The ice surface was egg-shaped, and chicken wire sat atop the boards that separated it from the stands. 
but for college hockey in 1952, it was the place to be. No rinks, you know, you only had the garden, the arena, skating club, and Lynn. We were the only four natural ice surfaces around, so it was a different era, really. Well, the story has it that the four athletic directors from the area schools, Bill Bingham from Harvard, John Curley from BC, Buff Dinelli at BU, and Herb Gallagher at Northeastern, uh, had made had planned for a tournament. They approached Walter Brown about it, and the time really was right because they all had very good teams. They all played in the Boston Arena. It became quite obvious to a brilliant arena manager such as Walter Brown that if you had a game involving BC, then a game involving BU, the crowd attendance was larger. If you had a game that maybe involved Northeastern and BU, then a game with Harvard, the crowd attendance once again doubled. So it became a little bit of common sense, wow, what if we take a quiet time like Christmas and we put all four on the ice? Aren't we going to have a pretty good attendance? The tournament was initially called the New England Invitational Hockey Tournament, but two issues remained. Who would play whom and for what? And, and of course, they discussed uh, how we're going to do this and how it's going to be equal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, so Walter just looked up and said, we'll have a rotation system, and let's do it in the order you gentlemen are seated in. And it has gone on like that now for 50 years. The legend has it that Walter Brown delegated the task to Tony Nota to go out and find a suitable perpetual trophy for the tournament. Maybe something like Lord Stanley's mug, but it had to be something that was distinctively Boston. So Tony went out and he could have come back with a sacred cod, he could have come back with a teapot, he could have come back with twin lanterns, but he came back with a silver bean pot. If Walter Brown and the athletic directors were the founding fathers of the Beanpot, it was the four original Beanpot coaches, John Snooks Kelly of BC, Harry Cleverly of BU, Cooney Weiland of Harvard, and Herb Gallagher of Northeastern, who put it on the sports landscape. The fact that you had uh, a Snooks, a Cooney, a Harry Cleverly, and a Herb Gallagher all at the same time, uh, it, it seems like now, 50 years later, uh, the stories that surround those guys have been passed on down through the generations to the point where uh, they're as good now as they were then. And, uh, and I think that uh, when you had that particular uh, uh, fraternity of coaches all at the same time, I think that's one of the reasons why we are where we are now. Herb Gallagher was one of the Beanpot founders. Even though he was not the athletic director, in those founding years of 1952, he was the hockey coach and the assistant athletic director. And the athletic director, Putty Parsons, left all things hockey to Herb. He was as technical as, as I, in our luncheons that anybody else was. Cooney was a, a professional player. But we didn't get into a lot of nuances at those days in the game. It was you skate your wing, you back checked, you stayed in position, you covered in the front. Cooney Weiland came to Harvard two years before the first Beanpot after an illustrious career with the Boston Bruins as a player and coach. He was one in a million. Uh, he was one of the great people. Uh, and uh, I learned so much from him, uh, not just about hockey, but about people. And, uh, and if you knew Cooney, you'd say, how could you learn about people from Cooney? Because Cooney was a man of very few words. But you know, he'd just look at you, look over those glasses at you, and God, one look from Cooney would say a thousand words to someone else. You learned more about life than you learned about hockey from Cooney. And I would suspect people, uh, Snooks Kelly might be the same, and I know Jack Kelly as well, but um, if you did something silly on the ice, something ridiculous, uh, dangerous perhaps, he would just ask you to have, to have a seat, and you'd just sit there, you sit there. And, you know, it, your line would go, no, no, you just sit there. We'll, we'll call you eventually, and uh, you just think about things. And he wouldn't tell you why, but you knew why. Harry cleverly guided the BU hockey program through its infancy. It was funny when I went to BU as a freshman, Harry, Harry, uh, the team that he had in 51 was all veterans. You had Garrity, Cahoon, all those guys had been in the service. But, no, Harry was a, he was a wonderful person, and he was a good coach. He, he inspired me to do the best I could when I went on the ice. I, I enjoyed Harry. 
Boston College's Snooks Kelly would regale all who would listen that the bean pot was a social and athletic must, and he felt that way from year one. Snooks got in the dressing room and said, guys, this is going to be the greatest hockey tournament in college hockey. This will go on for years and so on. And of course, all the guys in the dressing room said he is full of whatever. And uh, so, uh, but I uh, guess you have to look back and say it was a real profit there. His pregame pep talks probably would border on Newt Rockney's and Vince Lombardi's and people like that. He always had a way of getting us up so that when that door opened, we'd just go onto the ice and play with, as he used to say, reckless abandon. There's one favorite story that all the BU guys like to remember and, and uh, speak about. We, we, we were playing our games at the Boston Arena, and our dressing room was right next to uh, Boston College's. And we're going into the third period, and I can't remember if it was a 2-2 tie or we were down by a goal or whatever the score really was. But we could hear Snooks really getting into the play, and he, he was building to a crescendo, and finally he came out with his final remarks, and they charged out the door. And we're all just sitting there kind of listening to it. And Gar Harry comes in and says, and that goes for me, too. <laughs> so we got up and charged out the door, too. <laughs> the first bean pot of 1952 was greeted with overwhelming nonchalance. The game was just one more game. In fact, when the, when the schedules were published, like in the spring, we looked forward to playing. There wasn't a bean pot on the schedule, and then they sort of fit it in. So it was just another game squeezed into our winter schedule. And it was uh, two nights, the day after Christmas and the day after that, the 26th and the 27th. In the inaugural game, Northeastern's goalie Ray Picard was pelted by Boston University. BU won 4-1. to one. Well, it, it's always nice to beat BU or BC or Harvard because they had top-notch hockey players, and we did too. But the, they seemed that a lot of... The, young people and then want to go five years to school. They'd rather get out in four years. And so they get the cream of the crop. And the ones we have were very competitive, but they got the scorers and we got the hustlers, but the, you need scorers to win hockey games. And we had a good defensive team, but offensively we didn't uh, have that much. The near capacity crowd of 5,105 next witnessed the emergence of the Beanpot's first star, Harvard's Walt Greeley. In the first game, we played Harvard, and we went into sudden death overtime. And uh, Billy McGuire, who never gets a penalty, got a penalty. And uh, Walt Greeley scored the winning goal on us. Dick Clansby got two very nice goals in the game, and the BC got a couple of good goals. I can't remember who, who got them. Um, and then in the overtime, as I recall, there was a scramble in front of the net, and a, in fact, a, I think a BC guy slid into the net about the same time the puck went in. It, was, it wasn't much of a, it wasn't a pretty goal, but it, uh, it did the trick. In the first championship game, the task for Harvard's Dick Clasby was clear. Stop BU's feared center iceman, Dick Rodenheiser. He was just very clever, very fast, uh, an outstanding scorer and uh, you just couldn't give him an inch. So it was, uh, I felt it was uh, uh, almost an honor to watch him. My job in the second game was to shadow Rodenheiser, and uh, uh, we did that fairly well, and he really didn't score, I don't think, until uh, the game was pretty much over. Walt Greeley's heroics continued. This time, a hat trick led the Crimson to a 7-4 victory, and Greeley was named the tournament MVP. The Bean Pot was off and running. In its second year, the Bean Pot moved to the Boston Garden. That tournament was held in January for the first and only time. Boston College, led by spark plug Bobby Babine, defeated Harvard in the championship game. The Bean Pot became a February fixture in 1955. It also marked the debut of Harvard's Billy Cleary whose legend would later grow with the 1960 United States gold medal winning hockey team. Uh, you know, in that era, probably the 60s through, let's say, the mid-70s, anyways, mid-70s and 80s, uh, I think Billy uh, Cleary was uh, by far the best American hockey player. In the opening round, Cleary scored five goals. Everything went right, you know. It was one of those nights that uh, 
uh, everything I shot, I think, went in. And uh, 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 someone was telling me I still hold some records. I said, God, doesn't speak well for hockey, but I'm still holding records for them. For <laughs> but they, you know, they were they were great. Uh, they were good memories. Uh, but even though you know that game, I guess I did score a lot of points. But I, I remember the BC game better than than that game. Believe me. In the championship game, an opportunistic Cleary was all alone at center ice when the puck came to him. With one swipe of the puck, he beat BC in overtime and incurred the wrath of Snooks Kelly. He always kidded me uh, in that game that we beat him 5-4 that, uh, uh, that I, you know, was out reading Playboy in center ice rather than being back in the zone where I should have, and that's why the puck came out to me. and. Uh, uh, whatever the reason was, Snooks, I'm glad it came out to me, that's all. <laughs> Kelly and the Eagles got their revenge over Cleary and the Crimson in the 1956 championship game with their own version of the floater play. We'd practice that by the hour at the skating club behind closed doors usually. He simply would take either a winger or a centerman and stick them way up at the far block, a blue line of the other team. Kind of uh, unnoticed, if you will. And he'd have a big defenseman up behind the net, and most of the time was Donald Fox, sometimes an R, only a Jack Gadigan. And we'd just work on sliding a long pass, either up off the boards, indirect, a direct pass for somebody going across the blue line. And more often than not, it would work. That was his trademark, deep. He used to yell deep, and we'd just go to our spots, and there's nothing more exciting in hockey than a breakaway, and we, we had our share. Harvard and Boston College met in every one of the first four bean pots. The streak ended in 1957 when Boston College defeated BU in the first championship game featuring the rivals from Commonwealth Ave. But it wasn't the floater play, but a fan shot by BC's Ned Bunyan that led to BC becoming the tournament's first back-to-back -back winner. The best part of it was, was that my closest friend at the time, Joe Quinn, was the BU captain. He was a year older being a senior, a great player and a terrific defensive player, was on the back check, as the photo shows, and by the expression on his face, which just looked like he's crying, uh, kind of epitomized the whole thing as the a goal is a goal is a goal and there's no pictures on the scorecard like golf. And uh, it's always one of my favorite pictures and whenever he gives me a hard time, I don't see him very much anymore, uh, I just show him this and hand it to him and that, that ends all conversations. The 1958 bean pot was the first to be played on the now traditional first two Mondays of February. Harvard's Bob Cleary, Bill's brother, was the leading scorer in the 1958 tournament. Bob, he was a terrific scorer, smart. Um, he didn't have the, uh, the skating ability that uh, Billy had, it, but uh, he was a good skater, but uh, um, he was just a uh, shifty and, and uh, just a, a good uh, college, certainly a great college player. But BU would take home the trophy that year, led by Bob Marquis from Montreal Catholic High School. Marquis became one of the most prolific scorers in Beanpot history. His 16 points ranked second all time. In 1959, BC goalie Jim Logue became the first non-forward to earn the most valuable player honor with 32 saves against Boston University. Jimmy could always play well in the big games. He always played well in the big games. Uh, I, mean, I can't think of a, a game that me meant something where he didn't uh, play outstanding. Now, that doesn't mean we won all of them, but at the same time, I'm sure we won you know, most of them, quite frankly, as a result of, uh, of Jim's play. Harvard's Bob Bland furthered the goaltender's cause with a 26-save Beanpot and MVP winning performance in 1960. Beanpot attendance was steadily in the 4 to 5,000 range until 1960. In other words, plenty of good rinkside seats were available. And I can always remember uh, in the one of the Beanpots, I got a penalty and I was in the penalty box and uh, a couple of my buddies, matter of fact, he went to Providence College. Um, I think he was spending more time outside the rink than he was in. And he thought it'd be nice if he spent the two minutes in the penalty box with me. <laughs> so he sat there, what are you doing in here? I mean, I'll never forget it. 
It was a riot. I'm trying to concentrate in the game, and he's having a beer doing that. It was wonderful. <laughs> but all that changed in 1961. A ticket to the bean pot, now in its 10th year, became a hot item when a capacity crowd of 13,909 filled the Boston Garden. I can remember uh, my senior year. Up until that, my sophomore year, we had about uh, 7,000 people in the stands. My, my junior year, we had about 8,500. But my senior year was the very first sellout, which was 13,909. And I think the, you know, the uh, aspirations of every young hockey player was to play in the Boston Garden before 13,909. The best way to find out how the bean park come of age is to see 13,909. That was the attendance down there, the max at the garden. And when they started to hit that, it's been, they came of age, the tradition is there, and uh, it's been virtually a sellout since then. All eyes that year were on Boston College defenseman Tom Red Martin, who had one of the most unforgettable days in Beanpot history. The kid, he got enough money to buy a car. It was not a Rolls Royce or anything like that. So his girlfriend down Milton wanted to go see the Beanpot, and Red says, I'll pick you up. So Red drives down, and even back then, Boston traffic was lousy, but he had an accident that was uh, a flat tire. In the meantime, you're supposed to be at the, the garden, I think it was an hour and a half before game time. There's Snooks going back and forth in the corridor. He's smoking up a storm. No red. Here's red changing the tire, you know. It's cold in early February. And uh, Snooks, I mean, Red is, gets the car fixed, the girlfriend's upset, we're going to be late, relax. They get up into the, around the garden area, no place to park, all that stuff. And Snooks, he's going living now. Finally, Red comes in, he's showing them out. Where you been, where you been? Let's say, I'll take the girlfriend. I quickly dressed and, and made it out to the ice uh, on time with the team, but uh, <laughs> needless to say, we were both a little bit uh, uh, upset about it. But in that game, uh, Snooks never took him out. In that game, Martin played 58 minutes with his only breather coming on a rare two-minute penalty and with a little help from his best friend. Tom and I, as I said, we were like bread and butter. We also managed to, uh, to uh, I, I don't want to say fake an injury, but my, my mask, in those days I had a clear plastic type uh, first mass that came out that way it would get fogged up and we used to have to clean it and uh, we'd get a few extra uh, breathers for Tom. Tommy uh, was class. Tommy got away with murder on the ice. I mean he was so polite to the officials he'd pick up the puck and hand it to them. The next thing he'd hit someone with an elbow and get away with it. And when he went to the penalty box it never he was never the official made a lousy call he always thanked him and got in the box and got away with murder on the ice but he could move the puck real well. I don't think I ever gave Red a penalty. I would say, we never gave him a penalty, why? I said, if the puck was down there, Red would pick it up and hand it to me. That's all he had to do because I guess I was a lazy bastard. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't go get it. But I, I never forgot him because of that. And I tell him that, you know, to his face. I said, you know, you'd hand me that puck every time the puck went somewhere, I didn't have to hit it. I said, I'd look at you and I, you could do whatever you want unless you kill somebody. You know, I mean, the fact that, uh, that he was the 58-minute uh, the man, uh, almost a 60-minute man, if it wasn't for a two-minute minor penalty, uh, is just amazing. And I think that uh, a story such as that, as it's carried on down uh, through the generations of hockey, is, uh, is going to be one that uh, I think is going to uh, leave mouths open wide for generations that read the Beanpot story and become familiar with what the Beanpot was all about. In 1961, Northeastern's Arthur Chisholm won the Walter Brown Award as the most outstanding American player in New England. Unfortunately, Chisholm knew nothing but hard luck in the bean pot. The ice was kind of bad and we were playing Harvard. And uh, so it was decided that uh, they would split the game. First period, second period, then in the third period they go 10 minutes, 10 minutes. But I didn't know this. And it must have been at the 9, 9.50 mark I got a breakaway and I was on my way because I had played terribly and just as I crossed center ice the horn went off and I said, the period's over? <laughs> and apparently it was over, it was the 10 minute mark. <laughs> Even playing in only three years, 
his 15 bean pop points still puts him way in the top echelon uh, of bean pot scores. It was possible back then, uh, you'd read back that uh, Harvard was facing Chisholm tonight, uh, that Artie Chisholm was a one-man team and he could do it to you on any given evening. Many people talk about him as, uh, as one of the, maybe the most underrated uh, great American hockey players uh, ever. A uh, guy that had an opportunity to play in the National Hockey League when uh, there was a, a paucity of Americans in the National Hockey League. Uh, in terms of the bean pot, uh, I guess the, uh, the, the name that he's often uh, referred to in the bean pot is the greatest player to never play in a bean pot final. And I think he's absolutely deserving of that. His numbers in the bean pot and his performance for his Northeastern team uh, would, uh, would certainly uh, bear that out. In 1962, Gene Kanasiewicz made the trek from Edmonton, Alberta to Harvard Yard and led the Crimson to the Beanpot title. I always thought Kanasiewicz could have been a pro player if he was, he was small, you know. He would skate like the wind and he was tricky. The Beanpot is a, is a team event. It's not an individual event. And, and I don't think any MVP would remember that they were the ones that dominated. Uh, uh, it, it really is a team effort because the, once you hit the ground, you're three feet off the ground. And, and if, if your entire team isn't uh, performing uh, equally, th then you, you know, you're know you not going to win. So therefore, I don't think an individual can take credit. Harvard had a goalie. Uh, played on the same team with uh, Timmy Taylor and Gene Kanasiewicz and those guys. The name was Godfrey Wood. Some kid on the other team really got hurt and went crashing down on the ice and uh, Woody came out of the goal. The game was still going on and he, and he bent himself over the kids so that no one would skate into him, right? And I said, boy, that's, that's really sportsmanship for my money. Prior to the 1963 Beanpot, BU hockey coach Harry Cleverly retired and Jack Kelly, no relation to Boston College's Snooks, was named to replace him. I can remember going to uh, Harry Cleverly's uh, banquet and everybody was getting up saying nice things about uh, Harry. Harry had just uh, retired and resigned and I had just been appointed the new BU coach. So I was there and Snooks got up and he said so many nice things about Harry and he finally said and when I look across the ice and I don't see you Harry it'll never be the same again. And I quietly thought to myself, I hope so. <laughs> because Snooks had been spanking Harry for a number of years, and I certainly didn't want that to happen. <laughs> but that was exactly what did happen for the next three years. In 1963, Billy Hogan returned the trophy and MVP honors to the Heights. And then one of the more inspiring players to ever play in the maroon and gold took to the ice and made the bean pot his own for the next two years. John Cunniff who grew up on 2nd Street in South Boston, wore number two so he wouldn't forget where he came from. Johnny was a uh, local kid. He was probably three or four blocks away from, uh, from our house. Uh, he and his brother, pretty much self-made hockey players. You know, it wasn't a case of we were in youth hockey leagues, uh, people taking us to games. Uh, that didn't happen. It was really us playing out in the, uh, we didn't even have a pond. There's no ponds in South. We, we'd flood the park and uh, we'd be playing you know, from the early morning till uh, till the uh, till it got dark. Well, he was a dangerous player because any time he was on the ice, you knew he could hurt you. And you know, as much as you try to check or put someone on him that couldn't maybe contain him, sooner or later he was going to get loose and, and hurt you. Uh, probably uh, with all the players uh, that I coached against at BC, Johnny was probably the. Uh, toughest player to contain. He, he was a, a real sniper and could catch you uh, lapsing at some point in time and, and burn you. In 1964 and 1965, boyhood friends Cunniff and Dennis O'Connell of Boston University met on the Garden Ice in championship games. Both times BC won. John Cunniff became the first and only consecutive year's winner of the MVP award. He, uh, he loved playing against us, there's no question about it. I, I always said his best games were against BU. He, he was a fierce competitor, and um, I, I guess BU brought the best out of him, you know, as was evident by his, uh, his two uh, Beanpot MVPs. 
Boston College was the big early winner in bean pot hockey. The Eagles captured eight of the first 13 bean pots. Somebody claimed that Snooks Kelly had filled the Zamboni with holy water. In the 1965 bean pot, two players, Boston College's Jerry York and Boston University's Jack Parker, would cross paths for the first, but not nearly the last time. I, I knew about the Parker boys from they were little young kids. They lived next door to my cousin Grace Kelly over in Somerville. And I used to hear about these young fellas, but I used to hear more about Bobby than Jackie, although they both played and they played from Alden Catholic. Uh, uh, I, I had heard, you know, they, both of them were pretty fair hockey players. Bobby probably a little better than uh, Jack. So naturally when they got to recruiting age, I spent a little time on them and hoped I'd get them both. Well, Bobby decided to go to BC and I ended up with Jack. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> but in any, in any event, uh, Jackie was a very, very bright hockey player. He, uh, he thought the game out exceptionally well. Uh, you'd only have to explain it once or twice to Jack, and Jack knew exactly what he wanted to do. Uh, he was kind of a, a coach on the ice. I mean, it was easy to see. Well, I think most of Jerry is. I remember Jerry in high school, and I remember him uh, in college, and he kept getting better and better. It wasn't like he was this big high school star that was a can't-miss guy and going to be a big college star. Uh, and uh, his sophomore year, he had a pretty solid year, and his, his junior year, he had a real good year, and his senior year, he had a great year. His senior year, he won the, uh, he was All-American. And he uh, was one of the best, uh, the Walter Brown one is the best player in New England, best American one player in New England. He was a, uh, and he was one of these guys that came out of, quietly just kept getting better and better. York's overtime goal in the first game propelled BC into the 1965 finals. But in 1966, despite the presence of John Cunniff, BU hung on to defeat BC in the opening game. Put down quickly and Johnny's got two goals right away. And he's already been the MVP of the Beanpot twice. Uh, in, the, in his sophomore and junior years, and all of a sudden he's looking like he's going to rip us apart again. Uh, but we wound up coming back and winning that game, and, and it was a big comeback for us. And I, I, I remember, as long as I live, I remember they were up by a couple of goals, and uh, Jack Farrar made an unbelievable save on uh, Bobby Kupka that was, you know, for sure. I, I was on the ice when it happened, and I, I thought for sure it was going in the net, and Farrar made an unbelievable save, and when, that kind of turned the game around. That save by Ferrara has gone down in Beanpot lore as the save. One week later, the save also gave BU captain Dennis O'Connell a chance to create a new Beanpot tradition. Yeah, I've been told by people, uh, just for some reason, I can still remember doing it, uh, taking the trophy and uh, skating it over to our, our fans. And, uh, you know, it was only the second time that BU had won it. So, uh, and then we just... Might, might as well make the best of it. Took it for a little twirl around the garden. You don't get that many opportunities. So and he's been, been doing it ever since. The stage was now set for a college hockey version of the Hatfields versus the McCoys. Boston College versus Boston University. Snooks Kelly versus Jack Kelly. I'd say there was tension there because the men, they admired each other, but they didn't like each other. I'd say there wasn't hate, no hate, because they're too big for that. They just didn't like each other. You had to beat BU, you had to beat BC. And uh, Jack would go to Camden and get some players. They come down, and then he got that dynasty going. And uh, yeah, there was tension. It was bitter. I mean, real bitter. As a Canadian, you, you could feel the vibes that, uh, and it didn't take long to figure out that they were all, all American kids. And we were, you know, half Canadian or two thirds Canadian and one third American. And, uh, we just wanted to win, and I think the intensity came because they were good, we were good, um, and uh, they were, you know, a couple of miles up the street and wanted to beat our brains in, and we wanted to beat their brains in, and then didn't, it, it certainly didn't help that the, the scouting reports with the Jack would do, talk about BC, and I'm sure Snooks did to talk about BU, just elevated the intensity level, but it was, uh, it was very intense forever, we believe me. Well, it was funny with Snooks, he was uh, an emotional guy. He would talk about how it was a bunch of boys from Boston and uh, Irish Catholics, he would always call us whether you were Irish Catholic or not, and uh, playing against um, these um, uh, kids from all over the place that, didn't, uh, that, that, that weren't from Boston, and this was our, uh, and the Beanpot was, was BC's tournament, and, and, um, and the Beanpot was, um, was part of uh, the Irish Catholic Boston legacy and we needed to win it and it was, it was special, it really was.
BU had one major advantage. Herb Wakabayashi and his pinball line teammates, Serge Boyley and Mickey Gray, were the best line college hockey had ever seen. We were playing Michigan one night in Boston. Uh, it was during one of those Christmas tournaments. And you know how the players line up along the, uh, the blue line, getting ready to take their shot in the, in the uh, pre-warm-ups? Well, his brother, Mel, uh, was playing and I just jokingly said, hey Mel, you got any young brothers back home? And he says, yeah, I got a kid named Herbie in his last year of school. I said, oh, <laughs> it didn't take me long to know where Mel lived and I made a trip up there and found Herb Wakabayashi. When Herb Wakabayashi played his first year at BU, which is a sophomore year, couldn't play in the varsity as a freshman in those days. His sophomore year, he entered BU. He started the season, and the record for most assists in the season was 33, held by Willie Quinn, who played left wing for Bob Marquis. Pretty easy guy to get assists with. But it was 33 assists in a season. And Herb Wakabayashi had 33 assists in December. <laughs> he wound up with 50 something assists, you know. So uh, that's the major reason why it was called the pinball line, because he was a fabulous player, but a great playmaker. You'd almost have to talk to him for someone to shoot it. I mean, get it, boom, 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 and someone would have to yell, shoot, because they wanted to set the other one up all the time. They were very generous with their assists. Wakabayashi and the pinball line helped themselves to the 1967 and 1968 Beanpot Championships. But in 1969, a Harvard club led by Joe Cavanaugh interrupted BU's streak. Joe Cavanaugh was a larger-than-life figure for me. I was a backup goalie as a sophomore, and Joe was a senior. But the story that John Powers has told is of Joe being so good at Cranston, Rhode Island, before he went to Phillips Andover and then to Harvard, that one team, the only way they thought they could stop him was to put two goalies in the net and then play four skaters in front of them. Uh, whether that's true or, or myth, it, it gives you an idea of what he was like. If you wanted to create a center Iceman, he was the man. Uh, we'd never seen anybody like him at Harvard, not since the, the two Cleary, certainly, uh, who could really just, you know, be an artist with the puck. And I don't think Harvard had won the bean pot for maybe seven years at that point. So he was the guy, but also he really raised his game a level. I think he had 19 points in three bean pots, and that's when freshmen weren't eligible. So he would have had many more, I think, had he been able to play, play, play all four years. But he was one of the best college players of his generation. I remember there was a snowstorm that day and the question was would the crowd be there and I think we had about 10, 12 inches of snow. It wasn't like the blizzard of 78 but it was still a good storm and 13909 were in the garden that night. It was a great, great thrill. It's almost as though you don't appreciate it when you're doing it. Now you look back and say, well, would that be fun to do again? Joe Cavanaugh's 19 career points is a bean pot record that may never be broken. Prior to the 1970 bean pot, Snooks Kelly sounded the rallying call for all bean pots past and present. On the bean pot tournament, we're going to show up. Anyway, we have to show up by contractual obligations to Eddie Powers. We got a tough assignment on Monday night with the uh, Northeast, and we've had trouble with them all through the years. Records mean, they don't mean anything, and uh, what kind of material you got is for the birds. This is a bean pot tournament, the greatest tournament in the country. 15,000 mad fans screaming wild, and we're going to be over there because we have an ulterior motive in that we have to get to BU or get to Harvard through Northeast, and so we're going to have to beat Northeast and get at one of those big boys that we really want. But it was not to be for BC, despite the presence of two-time All-American Tim Sheehy. I saw the kid skate, and he was a wonderful skater. And I says, hey, Tim, he says, tell me the truth. You're a Canadian, aren't you? Americans don't skate like that. And he says, no, I'm an American. He says, uh, my family all brought up in International Falls, but I was born in Canada, so my years go up, you know. I said, what? It turned out, say there's eight kids. And if the weather were lousy, Ma would go up north over the border. The hospital was like 10 miles closer than the one in Southern International Falls. So Timmy said it was a lousy day, so I was born in Canada. So I'm covering him as a sophomore, and he gets the game winner. So I put down Tim Sheehy, comma, the first Canadian born to wear a Boston College uniform, comma, Bing Bing scored the winning goal. In the second paragraph, I explained he's really American. He just went there because the, you know, hospital was closer. 
And what happened, they were a little tight. His father's the space went at the globe. So the, my buddy, the copy editor, he took that second graph out. So therefore, you look at this derby, he's Canadian. Snooks wouldn't talk to me for like two months. BU won in 1970 due to a remarkable performance by Wayne Gowing. Three goals in the third period. Is that right? Had the hat trick in the last period and we, we knocked off BC when we were on the ropes. Sure, I remember that. The great moments like that, all you gotta do is mention it, they come back to me, sure. The Beanpot Trophy did not have to move far for the next four years. It stayed right on Commonwealth Avenue with the Boston University Terriers. When Northeastern's unheralded coach Jim Bell left the bench in 1970, it was the first of many moves in the Beanpot coaching ranks. Jim was probably one of the most decent people I've ever met in my life. He passed away about a year ago. Jimmy played hockey, well, till about a week before he died. He loved the game, just the most perfect person you could imagine. Harvard's Cooney Wyland retired right after the 1971 season. I remember one time he came in the locker room in between periods, and we were, I think we were against BU, we were tie, and um, we didn't see Cooney at all. And about 10 seconds before we were, up, we were due to go out, Cooney just came in and said, you know, boys, I'm so proud of the way you're playing. I have nothing to say. Get out there and do it again. And that's kind of the way he was. Oh, Cooney's, he was a one of a, one of a kind. I mean, he was fabulous. Uh, the quiet, um, those steely eyes, um, but he had a, he, people didn't realize how warm Cooney really was, uh, but he never let you, he didn't want you to know that. And there would be cranky and cantankerous Cooney Wyland, and he'd just look at me and say, hi, Northeastern, and called me Northeastern uh, until his retirement in 72. Later on, about 10 years later, we started a Bean Pot alumni game uh, Cooney had been ill. He came up for the game. I met him at the back of the uh, Bright Center. Uh, he looked at me and once again just said, Hi, Northeastern. We chatted for just maybe 60 seconds or more. Cooney waved to go by, went about 10 feet, turned around and said, Bye, Jack. That was the only time that he ever used my first name in his life. After 1972, Jack Kelly of BU called it a college career. He came in one day, and that was just when that long hair was just starting to come in. There was, there was no such thing as long hair in Jack's locker room. And, uh, you know, he would, when it was time to get a haircut and you didn't get a haircut, he'd remind you that it was time to get a haircut. And the sideburns had to be a certain length. And Serge Boyley, he came in one day, and the sideburns were a little longer than what the, the rule was, and Jack went right up to him with a magic marker and put a little dot right here and said, didn't have to say a word. And he and Serge knew what to do, and the next day he went and got his sideburns shaved, and we were back on track. Jack Kelly was, the, again, a, the head of the curve. Uh, you know, there was a, I mean, it's, it's the BU power play uh, in 1964, and it's still, it's still in vogue today. And, uh, you know, his, his, uh, uh, I would say persistence of practicing it and practicing it and one of the things that a lot of coaches I think will tell you that practicing the power play can be very exasperating but Kelly was a you know he was a real nuts and bolts uh, persistent exacting uh, demanding coach and uh, he set up that BU power play and as if that weren't enough Snooks Kelly left his beloved Boston College but he also left a trail of stories most of them relating to his unique motivational skills. You, you could tell the difference between the periods that when the kids came back on the ice, it, it was a question of do or die. Uh, something had to motivate them, and it was John Kelly who would speak to them and explain to them what, what it meant to their college and um, to themselves, to their own self-respect to go out there and show the best they had. And, and really, they always did. Snooks was a, was a great orator, and he could get guys up. He'd you know, read these, uh, these great pep talks he'd have, and, uh, and every time we'd play BC, you know, you'd see them coming out, and God, he'd have them that high right off the uh, ground as they came out. So when we'd get them out there, we'd have to say, hey, what did he say today? 
You know, and they'd say, oh, this is the best yet. We were trying to deflate them. <laughs> After Snooks had them up, we were trying to deflate them so we'd get them down to where we wanted them to be when we dropped that first puck. If uh, we were losing uh, two to nothing or three to one at the end of the period, uh, Snooks would come in and say, uh, gang, uh, three snowflakes don't make a blizzard. <laughs> so that would you know, kind of loosen everybody up a little bit. Snooks Kelly is larger than life, so some of the stories are... are more from other stories, and you can't tell which was real and which was, you know, contrived after so many years. I mean, like, there's a story of him playing uh, Brown and hearing Jim Fulton yelling, you know, go into the diamond, go into the diamond, and Snuck's just leaning over and saying, look out for the diamond, look out for the diamond, <laughs> you know, with no explanation about what it means. I don't think there's anyone I ever met that loved BC uh, and what BC was about more than Snooks Kelly. I mean, he truly, truly loved that school, and therefore he loved the bean pot. You know, he loved Boston, and he, um, and he really, you know, people, co people coach, and then there's people that love their situation. He loved it, yeah. When the dust had settled, four new coaches, Lenny Siglarski of Boston College, Jack Parker of Boston University, Bill Cleary of Harvard, and Fernie Flamin of Northeastern would create a new coaching legacy. And then in 1973, the Bean Pot lost one of its biggest boosters with the passing of Garden President and Walter Brown's successor, Eddie Powers. Powers had often referred to the Bean Pot as his favorite event, and the championship trophy was named in his memory. The 1973 Bean Pot featured a five-goal opening night performance by BC's Mike Powers in a wild 9-8 overtime win against Northeastern. The championship was won by BU. The Terriers were led by a sophomore who became the top scoring defenseman in Beanpot history. Pick Stanfield is on a short list of the great players that have ever played in this tournament. You know, two-time Beanpot MVP, uh, you know, never looked like he could do much. And, you know, he was uh, uh, sort of a chunky sort of guy, uh, not a great skater, but he had, he just had the softest hands and great skill with the puck and great ability to control the puck in his own end. When he got the puck on his stick in his own end, they just didn't get it off his stick. And over two years, he controlled the bean pot in terms of the tempo of the game like no one else had ever played. As uh, anybody who always saw me play, I'd love to have the puck. If anybody had the puck, I wanted to get away from them. I love to carry the puck. I love to carry it from one end to the other. I like to read the plays and sometimes intercept passes and, you know, coming out of their own end. That's why a lot of times I had trouble sometimes. If it got by me, I'd be caught up ice. But most of my coaches, uh, they always made sure that that winger came back and covered up for me, so it, it made it a lot easier for me. Harvard and MVP winning Randy Roth interrupted BU's streak in 1974. In 1975, Vic Stanfield and the Terriers reclaimed the bean pot. The Terriers were also fortified by the presence of Rick Mahar, the school's only three-time All-American. He was one of the flashiest players ever to play college hockey because he was such a great skater. And he was a small, stocky guy as well, like Herbie. But you could see why he beat guys. He just beat them with just all out speed outside, or he was strong on his skates and could bounce guys and, and, and beat them inside. Uh, he's the only three-time All-American in BU history. Uh, arguably the best player ever to play at BU. BC's 10-year beanpot drought ended in 1976, thanks to freshman goalie Paul Skidmore. Skidmore had a style where he was up and down a lot and uh, I remember there were times where you know you'd see the bat the bottoms of his skates sticking out and uh, um, you'd think how did he get in that position or, or he'd be reaching out with a with his glove to cover a puck and, and get a whistle and and you'd think you know where did he come from and, and uh, um, but he got it done and I think that that was the MO on Skidmore was that uh, he might not have always looked pretty making the save, but he could make the save, and, and uh, he came up big that night. The team also featured a finesse player by the name of Richie Smith. With the puck, he was as good as any player that I ever had. I, uh, he played a little bit with Joey Mullen. That was a great combination, and, and uh, we all know what Joey did after he played at BC. But Richie was a great playmaker. He, uh, he never gave up the puck. He, he would look one way and pass the other. He had an uncanny uh, stick handling ability about him. He, uh, he just never gave the puck away. He wasn't a great, great scorer, but, but the, the kids that played with him, uh, they really enjoyed him because he was that good. Meanwhile, for Northeastern, the disappointments and the losses were mounting. 
The Huck line of Dave Sherlock, Charlie Huck, and Jim Martell finished as the top scoring line in the school's history, but they did not have a single bean pot to show for it. Harvard and coach Bill Cleary won the 1977 bean pot, with credit to Harvard goalie Brian Petrovic's hot hand. I think Brian was really the glue that held us together, and there's no doubt man for man, if you looked at our team versus BU, BU had a stronger team. But as so often has been the story in the bean pot, a great goalie can, can often influence a, a bean pot. You look at the number of times a goaltender has been MVP of the bean pot, and it's a kind of intense two-game series where a hot goalie can really uh, steal games for you. And we very much had that sense that, that it was a big upset for us to beat that BU team, and, and Brian really was the, uh, the reason why. In 1978, the bean pot finished a distant second to the weather. A bitter snowstorm that shut down the region for the better part of a week started to wreak its havoc on the bean pot's first night. Well, 4.30, uh, a bunch of us walked from the garden down to Durgan Park, and it still wasn't snowing. And when we came out of Durgan Park a quarter after 5, 5.30, it was snowing. It was snowing hard. And so we get back and we kept, got the first game in. Northeastern bus pulled up in front of the office building next to the garden. It was parked there. It was parked there a week later also. I'll never forget, I, I came outside the garden and I looked up and I had my, my uh, son and daughter and, and a friend of my daughter's, uh, Liz Hoy, who was with Paula and, uh, and we, uh, I said, let's go. So we get in the in the uh, car and I get on. I saw they were still going on the Southeast Expressway, so I get in, got on it, and went out the Mass Pike, and I can remember going off in West Newton. And it was kind of a blur because they had four or five uh, plows that were going along. And I said, hold on to your seats. We're splitting the defense here. And geez, we went up and we went around the ramp. It was, it was like a sheet of white. The trip from Babcock Street from the rink at BU to the Boston Garden, which usually took seven or maybe 10 minutes, took about 40. It felt like we had gone to UNH instead of uh, Boston Garden. Second game started, it was not a good, it was, a, it was somewhat of a rout. Um, and the, the, what really got us was uh, there were 11,666 clicks on the turnstile. That number of people showed up out of 13,909, which is fabulous. The MBTA said that they were going to stop service. It was part of our duty to let the fans know that the, the MBTA was going to suspend service. He read it. Nobody moved. We knew there was a bad storm predicted, and we knew that uh, things weren't going well, especially when they come over the loudspeaker announcing, this is the last train leaving North Station if you want to get out of here. Uh, but I had no idea till we get outside and on the bus that, uh, holy man, we were picking up people on the way. They were just trudging along, picking up fans, and our bus was filled to capacity. As we were grinding up Commonwealth Ave, Jack O'Callaghan, our captain, asked Jack Parker. We were all pushing O'Callaghan to, to let us off at, in front of the dugout cafe, which was the, the local watering hole. So O'Callaghan finally got up the nerve to ask Parker if we could get out at the dugout, and Parker wasn't going to accommodate us by letting us out in front of the dugout because that would be, I think, against, uh, against Jack's principles. But uh, what he did do was say that we could get out uh, about 50 yards up farther in front of Marsh Chapel, and anyone that wanted to go to church and say a prayer or two um, could say a prayer at Marsh Chapel and, and that he was okay with that. And uh, I remember that as we were getting off the bus, Billy Cotter, who's a, a real good guy and a Charlestown guy, and, um, turned to me and said, uh, hey, Silky, you know, I'm, I'm a good Catholic, but uh, we just won the bean pot. I'm not going to go to church now. And someone had to explain to him that that was Jack's way of letting us, uh, letting us out somewhere near the dugout. But uh, so we all went to the dugout, and, uh, and we, stayed, uh, we stayed probably uh, longer than we should because by the time we get out, I think the snow was gone, and uh, I think the 70s were gone too. After the snow had been cleared, the 1978 bean pod was completed on March 1st. 
three weeks after the first round games. BU star Jack O'Callaghan captured MVP honors, and the Terriers repeated the next year with the unsung Daryl McLeod leading the way. Annually, for the Harvard people, for the Boston College people, and the BU people, the bean pot was a yearly celebration. For the Northeastern people, it was a yearly humiliation. 27 years, no championships. Thus, a small but powerful group of Northeastern alumni and varsity club members started discussions about dropping out of the bean pot. Being a Northeastern alum, you bleed red and black, you lose with the team, you win with the team, and it almost got to be a, a funny sort of joke, not ha-ha, but, you know, hey, we're the Huskies, and we're going to be there. We're going to fight you tooth and nail. You're going to beat us, but so what? But it was not a lot of fun, to be very frank about it. Not a lot to be proud of, at least in the hockey team, in terms of success. Northeastern uh, perennially played the first game the first night at 6.15, and unfortunately, perennially, pretty much played the second game the second night at 6.15. Uh, all my so-called friends picking up on that tabbed me 6.15 Grenoble. Coach Fernie Flamin and his Northeastern team entered the 1980 tournament with a 3-11 and record. We didn't have a good record, but I will say that um, we did during the offseason lose significant players to the pros, Chris Nyland. Uh, we lost some other players, Jimmy Walsh, who we had counted on coming back. And so we didn't have the strongest team going in. All signs for the Huskies pointed to next Monday, 6:15, and business as usual. However, the Huskies had other ideas. It was like five minutes into overtime, and I was sitting on the bench, and um, I just said to him, kind of to myself that it's getting kind of late here, someone better do something. And I thought that the next time I go over the boards, I'm, if I get a chance to get the puck, I'm going to try as hard as I can to get it down towards their end and get a shot on net and, you know, see if we can score and create some chances. Uh, Johnny Montgomery, uh, uh, I could remember that very clearly, that he got the puck uh, up around the blue line, I guess, and he was skating and uh, he just let it go and he caught the uh, BU goaltender by surprise, I guess, and went by him, so that was the start of it all. And then, who do they have to go up against? The number one team in the East at the time, Boston College. You would never think that Northeastern was going to be Boston College, but there we were. We were glad just to be in the finals, you know? It was something different. We're in the finals. We don't have to go early. What are we going to do? We, did, we worked very hard in practice, in and between. We, we didn't even have a day off after we won the first game. We didn't have a day off. We just went back at it, and uh, it was probably the hottest we ever worked in practices when I was at Northeastern. Northeastern's behind 3-1 early, but yet they somehow come back and they tie it at, you know, 3-3. But you get the feeling that this is not a Northeastern team that is going to lay down on that particular night. They're going to fight tooth and nail. They may lose, but it's going to be a game. You just had that feeling. And then they fall behind 4-3, but with three and a half minutes to go, Paul McDougal ties it, and everybody figures this is the year. This is the year. Just shortly before the end of regulation, perhaps 10 seconds or so, uh, I had a semi-breakaway and an opportunity to score and, and did not succeed. Everybody was into it, you know, especially when it went to overtime. Wouldn't this be something if, if Northeastern won this thing? So it was not an anti-BC thing. It was, uh, this would be great for Northeastern to finally win this thing. And, and the emotion in the building was really something. Uh, certainly everyone was in that... Uh uh, in that garden cheering for them, uh, especially, except for the team that they're playing against. The fans, like I said before, they, most of them stayed just to watch to see what would happen. And I think, uh, well, nine-tenths of them, I think, were on our side. And then, just 2.47 into overtime, Wayne Turner fired the shot heard round the Beanpot world. Generally pass, shot score! I think every fan almost stayed uh, for that whole game because uh, the ovation that the kids got, you know, from the crowd. And they said, well, it's over. They finally did win. 
and uh, everybody seemed like they were on our side, which uh, I felt was great. Fernie's been a great friend over the years, and, and there are some people that you don't mind losing to, and I told Fernie that too, that, uh, that uh, after the game was over, I said, if we had to lose, I said, I'm glad it was you. I always remember, I was like one of the last ones off the ice, and the ushers there, the people were just crowded around the exit. To, you know, for the players to get off the ice, there were so many, and uh, there was like three ushers, and uh, they told me, put my helmet back on, and they escorted me down the hall, and the hall was, the corridors were just full of people. The celebrations afterwards, and uh, there was an establishment near the Northeastern campus that uh, actually stayed open very, very late, uh, and I think the police sort of looked the other way because they knew what was going on, and uh, we were there with the Northeastern hockey people, the uh, the people from, uh, you know, the, the, the Boosters Club, and it was a wild party that went past 3 o'clock in the morning. Forgotten in all the hoopla that 27 years of frustration brings is that Northeastern's victory was actually the first miracle on ice in 1980. 1980, I was up at Lake Placid with the U.S. Olympic team, and of course there were four guys from BU on that team. And the bean pot was during the Olympics. And I remember going to practice for the U.S. team, and Mike came out, Mike Ruzioni, and said, do you know who won the bean pot? I said, yeah, Northeastern. And it was like, what? Northeastern won the bean pot? And I said, yeah, they did. He said, well, it wouldn't happen when we were there. <laughs> also overlooked is that it was a defenseman who captured the MVP award. The man that walked off with the most valuable honors that evening was defenseman and Captain Dave Archambault. Dave was on the ice for a registered 42 minutes during that game. And he claims that every time he managed to get off the ice before he could even put his head down to take a breath, Fernie would yell, get in Dave, get in Dave, get in Dave. He was a very tough skater and he played JV most of the time. And I used to watch the games, and he worked and worked, and he worked himself up to a player that really wanted to be a hockey player. And uh, we did give him the chance, and uh, as Wayne Turner said, that the, uh, he's one of these kids that give you uh, very hard body checks, and uh, every second he was on the ice, he was a competitor. And that's what I liked about him. And he did help us win that uh, first bean pot, really. The Beanpot had finally become a four-team tournament, and it lived up to that billing, as for the only time in its history, all four teams would win it in the four-year period between 1980 and 1983. Harvard with Wade Lau and Mark Fusco won in 1981, followed a year later by BU and Cleon Daskalakis. I think Cleon came to Boston University at a time when we were down a little bit, and we needed a, a savior, we needed somebody who could jumpstart us back into the upper echelon, and, and Cleon was probably that guy. Uh, and, and quickly after Cleon got there, I believe the next year, John Cullen came in. So now we had the scorer and we had the uh, goaltender, and we, we very honestly had an awful lot of hardworking, uh, tough, competitive guys. Boston College seniors, including Lee Blossom and Eddie Rossio, were on the ice in 1980 when Wayne Turner's goal started the Born Again Bean Pot. 1983 was their final chance at a bean pot. Everybody wants to win the bean pot. It's a, it's a special feeling, and uh, not not being uh, being your last chance at the bean pot. I think everybody. Yeah, we did talk about that, and in particular the older guys, the juniors and the seniors uh, that played in, in the 1980 game. I, you know, and, and had some. Uh, uh, not so good memories about the bean pot. So now it was uh, their last chance to create a good memory, and we did. But it was a freshman, Bob Sweeney, who struck first for the Eagles. I was a winger at the time, playing with uh, Eddie and Lee Blossom, Eddie Rossio, and uh, I just came down the wing and shot it, and it went in. And that's, like I said, it just started from there, and it just kept coming, and it was. Like I said, the final was eight to two, and it was good knowing, and I'm especially for the older guys in that third period, knowing that they're gonna win the bean pot in their last attempt. And it was a freshman who strolled off with the MVP award. It was, it was a great honor winning the MVP as a freshman, but um, I think Eddie will, will still tell me to this day that I stole it from him, Eddie Rossio. <laughs> I think we both had two goals and four assists in the tournament, and uh, you know, it's 
all, uh, all the older guys, they, they were happy for me. Um, and I, I was just happy to, to win the bean pot. The 1984 bean pot was a study in the brotherhood of hockey. Sitting in the stands was Terry Flamin, son of the Northeastern coach, and a former Harvard player who was gravely ill with cancer. Before the first game, Terry, uh, by then in a wheelchair, wheels himself into the next the team dressing room, wants to address the team, tells them that this is a year for another Northeastern bean pot, that he has great faith in them, tells them that he assures them that seven days from then, we will be in this dressing room celebrating that bean pot. It was the year that my son was sick and my wife was also had a broken leg and they were in wheelchairs up in the stands. And uh, we did win it that year. And I, I can remember the team uh, taking the bean pot to the area where they were and presenting it to him. They, they carried the wheelchair, he swung himself down on the railings and came in the locker room. And it was very emotional. Terry once again wheels himself into the dressing room raises the bean pot on high and says, I told you you could do it, you did it, and the place just breaks up into a combination of tears and cheers. The whole locker room, you got these tough kids, you know. They all started bawling, I did too. It was uh, the most emotional thing I'd ever seen connected with the bean pot. I can still see him there. It is rare when there are four-year fixtures in the bean pot, but Northeastern unveiled one in goal in 1985. Bruce Racine put on a show worthy of an acrobat. Here's Veen. He's got Gerlitz with him. The shot is stopped by Racine. Keeper Mark Laurie finished off BU with two goals in the third period. And suddenly, the Northeastern Huskies had won three of the last six bean pots. Won the, second consecutive bean pot tournament. the 1986 Bean Pot started off with a bang. Before the championship game against BC, Coach Jack Parker issued a challenge to defenseman Scott Shaughnessy. Uh, Coach Parker uh, had talked to uh, Scott about if he, the fact that he knew the difference between the term Sikkim and come here. Jack, at the prodding of his twin brother Bob, uh, asked to uh, maybe try to uh, differentiate between those terms for his, uh, his rock-solid uh, policeman-type defenseman, Scott Shaughnessy. And uh, as a result of Scott uh, having a grasp of that particular uh, concept, uh, he went out and, uh, and just rocked the Eagles right from the opening face-off. You know, they're, they're, they're birds and we're dogs, and what, what does a dog do? Sick them. Go get them, boys. And, uh, the puck was dropped with Sweeney about to collect the pass when Shaughnessy came and just rim rocked him in the boards and knocked him over and blew around kind of set the tone for the rest of the game. After Shaughnessy delivered, so too did Terry Talifer for the Terriers. The second game of the 1987 Bean Pot provided more two-game fireworks than any in history. In the consolation game, Boston College coach Len Seglarski was seeking career win number 556. That would make him the winningest coach in college hockey history. Seglarski and Harvard's Bill Cleary needed every victory they could muster to enhance their status for postseason play. However, regulation ended in a 6-6 tie. We were televised in the consolation game, and then, you know, we were told they weren't going to play overtime in the consolation game. So I was doing the game with Sean McDonough, and he went down the press room to get a bite to eat, and I'm sitting up there in the, in the stands, and I'm... Uh, ready for the next teams to come out. You know, Harvard and BC had just played, and I'm ready for BU Northeast to come out and play the final. And I looked down, and the, the teams are coming out in the ice, and I'm saying, those are funny uniforms. Those, those aren't the Northeast and BU uniforms. What are those guys doing out there? The game appeared to be the first in Beanpot history to end in a tie. Until... The ruling on the ice was the puck was in the goal before time expired. I remember Joey Albert was the referee. He called it. Um, I don't know whether it was at the end of the game, right before the end of the game, or after the game was over. I don't know that. But I know one thing. The minute his hand went up, I just 
told all the kids in the bench, get on the ice. I told, get on the ice. And we just had them go on the ice and start celebrating. As it turned out, when the goal was scored, my son Tim happened to be on the team, and, and he stepped on my toe, and I think I must have jumped right up into the balcony. It was, uh, and I know I had to get a new pair of shoes after that. There was more to come. The championship game between BU and Northeastern was one of the most frantic hockey games ever played on Causeway Street. The action surged back and forth all night long. The teams countered with former Beanpot MVPs in goal. Bruce Racine, now a junior for the Huskies, and Terry Talifer, a senior with the Terriers. BU also featured John Cullen, the school's all-time leading scorer. The game appeared to be over with BU ahead 3-2. In the final minute, Racine was taken out of the Northeastern goal in favor of an extra attacker. O'Brien kept it in, shot, score! David O'Brien was a most unlikely hero, a walk-on to the Northeastern University hockey team who had to talk his way on as well. See, I didn't care for kids who were late when we were doing things, especially in practice. And uh, I didn't feel that he wanted to be a part of a team because he didn't show up one time, but he came in and he had a good reason why he was late and uh, we went along with him. And... Uh, I tried out for the JV team, uh, made the JV team, played about six or seven games. Um, and the, the way I sort of got brought up was one of the uh, players on the varsity was taking the state police exam on a weekend and couldn't <laughs> couldn't play in the game that weekend so I got brought up and stayed uh, throughout my freshman year and throughout the next three years. David O'Brien's heroics would be short-lived. In overtime, BU's Mike Kelfer struck with as violent a shot as you will ever see in a hockey game. Kelfer, turn around, stop. A turnaround jump shot, as I refer to it as. It was uh, it, the he taken a shot or somebody else had taken it. I think he took a shot and the puck bounced straight out 15 feet right back to him and he was spun around a little bit and he just turned around right again and took a almost like a 340 degree turn, got the puck on a stick and rifled a slap it by the goaltender in Northeastern. And won, uh, that was an overtime goal and the game was over. Uh, MVP. Get the goal in overtime, you're MVP. Northeastern would exact its revenge in 1988. David O'Brien pumped in two third period goals that sealed a 6-3 victory. But the story of the game was Bruce Racine, who bracketed his freshman year MVP performance with another in his senior year. He became the first goalie to be a two-time MVP and the tournament's first two-time winner of the Eberle Trophy, which has been given every year since 1974 to the top Beanpot goalie. Before every game, he used to have this routine where he would walk up the steps, I believe it was the Prudential building before every game, and that was sort of a crazy routine that he used to have. But, uh, you know, he was just a fabulous goalie. He had a quick glove. Um, he always seemed to play well in the bean pot and, and in front of the big crowds, and I think he sort of relished that. Well, Bruce Racine was the core of that Northeastern team. You know, when you look, when you look at why Northeastern won, they had the Heimbach, they had uh, uh, Ross, they had some good players, and they had uh, Fernie in, uh, as the coach. But Racine was tremendous. He was, uh, uh, when, when you talk about superb performances, that wasn't the only place he was great. He was great all year, but he turned it up a notch in the bean pot and was exceptional. And when you, look, when you talk about great cool, uh, uh, bean pot goalies, Racine is at the top of the list. After not winning any bean pots for 27 years, Northeastern, with four in eight years, had become the team of the 80s. Their rejuvenation can be credited to Fernie Flamin, an old school coach who guided the Huskies into a whole new era. Fernie was not a big believer in giving the, the guys water during practice. Um, you know, I guess in the, the, back in the old days, you just sort of grind your way through practice, and uh, there wasn't any water on the bench. and. Uh, what he used to do is have the trainer put out um, chips of ice in a, in, a, in a big bucket and you'd grab the ice and hopefully it'd melt in your mouth and you'd be replenished that way. And one day someone said, you know, why can't we have water? So we were in the locker room and Fernie w walked in with a balloon and he filled the water. He filled the balloon with water and, it, you know, if you've ever thrown a water balloon, it's, it's sort of jumping up and down. He said, fellas, because that's what your belly's going to feel like if you use too much water. <laughs> One of the, one of the under, underrated bean pot coaches, Fernie Flamman, rejuvenated and resurrected the Northeastern program as a program, as a national program, and in the bean pot. 
There is but one word, elegant, to best describe the hero of the 1989 bean pot. Lane McDonald's shorthanded goal was typical of the magic he and his Harvard mates rode on their way to the national championship. I, you know, what I remember about Lane McDonald in his career, smooth as silk, uh, you know, you'd, you'd watch the game and you wouldn't really notice what Lane McDonald had done. And then at the end of the game, he had two goals, three assists, and he played great defense and probably hadn't been scored against all night long. And, you know, he was one of those guys, Hobie Baker Award winner, uh, but a great big game player and uh, an MVP of the Beanpot, and he was tremendous in that series. The Beanpot was sweet for McDonald, a product of Wisconsin, but even sweeter for some of his teammates. I was just absolutely ecstatic. But you could tell the guys who grew up in state, who had grown up with a Beanpot, for them, it was, a, it was truly, they've been dreaming about this since they were five, let alone when I started thinking about it when I was 17. The 1989 Bean Pot was the fifth championship as either a player or coach for Harvard's Bill Cleary. His is a legacy that may never be matched. Coach Cleary is just a great guy, and we all respect him so much. And he had an unbelievable ability to be your coach, your mentor, and your friend. But I'll tell you, when it came down to bean, bean pot or any game, the intensity that he brought to the game, forget about all the fun stuff, all the practical jokes, but the intensity that he brought to when you play BU or Northeastern and BC, you couldn't help as a player to feel that intensity and, and know how important each and every game was. If there's one family that has spanned the entire 50 years, it's the Cleary family of Cambridge. If we go back to 1952, Bill Cleary Sr. was one of the leading hockey officials in America. He was on the ice for the very first bean pot in 1952. The next bean pot, Bill was on the ice and brother Bobby to follow. And after they were through their great playing careers, both of them became hockey officials. By the time that they had exhausted those careers, Bill was back as the Harvard freshman coach, and then the Harvard varsity coach, and from therein to the Harvard athletic director. So for 50 years, there has been a Cleary either on the ice or coaching or running the tournament. Some may have taken offense, but there was a prevailing sentiment that the Bean Pot became the BU Invitational in the 1990s. Many of those years were unique because of unsung players like Dave Tomlinson in 1990, who ended the tournament in the Bean Pot spotlight. Others followed in Tomlinson's unsung hero role, Mike Prendergast in 1992. Kenny Rausch in 1995. Ken Rausch, score! Bill Pierce in 1997. And Michelle LaRock in 1999. At BU, it seems that over the years, it's always been the second or third line guys um, that have come through in the clutch. And, and I think that sometimes people make the mistake when they look at BU hockey over time and, and they think that, uh, you know, BU hockey is all about Amante or, or McGeckin or Kachuk, and I, I think it's much more about uh, the Bavises and, uh, you know, the O'Sullivans and, and the rank and file guys because over time the Daryl McLeods and, and Billy Carters were guys that won an awful lot of bean pots and an awful lot of games for BU. Of course, it helped that BU teams have had stars like Tom Pody in 1998, who rose to the occasion. In front, locked again. Back to Pody. Closing in front, tip, scores! BU's glory year turned emotional when their teammate Travis Roy, who had been paralyzed in a tragic hockey accident, joined the celebration on the ice. In a, a real poignant moment, a very emotional moment for everybody involved. Uh, Travis came out and joined uh, the Terrier seniors and uh, captains and Coach Jack Parker when the Terriers received the bean pot uh, that year. That was, that was a very memorable moment to see Travis come out and receive the ovation that he did from, uh, from the crowd at the Fleet Center. But for sheer perseverance, 
Few performances can match what Tony Amante did after being leveled by BC's Joe Cleary in 1991. and now the whistle stops for the bone-jarring hit. Amante's response was almost as quick and furious as Cleary's check. To see him uh, take the, uh, the clean, hard hit from Joe Cleary, the BC defenseman who just absolutely laid him out, and, uh, and to see him get up, I mean, almost in a boxing-like uh, uh, scenario, to get up off the canvas, if you will, and come back and not only get a hat trick, but get a hat trick in five minutes and 24 seconds. I mean, just rapid fire. Uh, turn the entire game around. Uh, you knew if you didn't know already, and I think everybody around the BU program that was watching him on a regular basis knew that uh, we had something special with Tony Amante, that he just took it to another level that night. The 1995 bean pot was the last to be played in the Boston Garden. The Fleet Center became center stage when Chris Drury and the Terriers continued their winning ways in 1996. Five to three, BU. Chris Drury understands uh, what's important in life, and it's not just the stars or it's not the person that's going to get him somewhere. And uh, uh, if Chris Drury calls BU every year, ten times a year, I'm pretty sure that uh, three of the calls are to Jack, but the other seven are to the. Uh, the trainer or the equipment man or people that he deems important, not just a superstar. And that's the way Chris Drury thinks. He thinks about everybody, thinks about the big picture, uh, and it, it speaks volume for the character of the kid. And that's what will always be remembered in our mind is we could kind of uh, take a break when Chris Drury was at BU as a coach because he had things in line and uh, he set the example that uh, we all dreamed about having with the program. I asked Chris one time, uh, you know, things, he wasn't, he was a senior and things weren't going well and I didn't do this to too many guys, but I said, no, 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 you know, if you could, just out of curiosity, if you're comfortable with your line mates, you know, if you could play with anybody in the club, who would you like to play with? And without playing nice, oh, that's easy, Travis Roy. <laughs> Travis was in a wheelchair. Uh, they were best buddies and, you know, you know, Chris was always concerned about what Travis was doing and, and Travis really respected Chris, so it was nice to see that whole thing evolve and, uh, he was all smiles and thinking it was quite a night. Eight championships in ten years created a BU beanpot blur, which was interrupted twice in the 90s. After the 1992 season, Len Saglarski retired from his exemplary coaching career. Lenny was great. Lenny was the, probably the finest person I've ever met in my life outside of my family. He was a great coach, a great um, motivator, a great uh, teacher. And uh, he was a, uh, one of the reasons I went to BC. Saglarski was succeeded by Steve Cedarchuk, whose trying two years as coach included one divine beanpot moment in 1994. Playing a heavily favored Harvard team, BC was fortified by tournament MVP Greg Taylor, who made 61 saves in the two games. The BC heroics were provided in overtime by a Tom Ash goal that caught everyone by surprise. Ash looking, both teams changing, he scores! Tom Ash! Boston uh, Cedar, who bled maroon and gold, uh, uh, that was uh, a huge win for him and uh, ended a drought for BC. A long, long time without winning the, winning the bean pot with great players that they weren't able to get it done. And uh, maybe with not as great a team, they won it that night, then it was a big one for Steve. And I always felt like um, um, I, I think that maybe God, the God of hockey, quote, knew that I was going to be finished. And he was like, hey, you worked hard. You've uh, done a lot of good things. And I'm going to give you this memory. And, uh, and I always felt, I know that sounds silly, but I've always felt that way about it because we were such underdogs in both games. We won two overtime games. Um, and, I, and I've kind of, you know, I, I, I've always felt that way. And so it's, it's, it's been pretty neat. Harvard tasted Beanpot success in 1993 with Ron Tomasoni behind the bench. Crimson forward Ted Drury, a year removed from the Olympics, led the tournament in scoring and garnered MVP honors. Despite these successes of BC and Harvard, Boston University was the dominant Beanpot team of the 1990s. And the man who guided them is their coach, Jack Parker, who is the all-time leader in Beanpot wins. When I was being recruited by Jack Parker, uh, I think one of I think what won me over was he said to me, "I don't know if you need a, a pat on the back or a kick in the ass, but you'll probably get a little of both." And uh, and I think 
that's the way Jack Parker has always been. He feels every pass, he feels every shot, he feels every block shot, he feels every bad play, he feels every good play. It's so, you know, he, when you see him after most games, he's, uh, he's, usually, uh, he's usually drenched with emotion. It's going to be a cold day in hell when another coach can say that he's won uh, 16 Beanpot titles. The 2000 Beanpot champions possessed an absolutely lethal combination of skills, and of all players, a goaltender. BU's Rick DiPietro exhilarated a Fleet Center crowd with save after save. DiPietro also left mouths agape with several picture-perfect passes. Of all the players in Beanpot history, it would be hard not to include Boston College's Brian Gianta as a player who was single-handedly worth the price of admission. Anybody that went to the Beanpot when Gianta was playing for four years at BC uh, walks out of the arena talking about the, they may be talking about the team that won and they may be talking about the Beanpot MVP, but the guy they're talking about as much as anybody is Gianta. You know, of, of guys that never won a Beanpot MVP, nobody played harder, nobody made more spectacular plays, nobody laid down on the ice diving and blocking pucks uh, more than Gianta's. While Gianta was the guiding light on the 2001 Beanpot champions, BC was truly a team on a most inspired mission. The bean pot meant so, so much to those kids. I can remember Marty Hughes just crying and bawling on the ice. His mother had passed away about a month prior to that, and it just meant so much to him. And uh, I get kind of emotional even thinking about it, but the, he just, uh, it meant so much to him and his teammates. And they dedicated the game to uh, Marty Hughes' mother. The Beanpot turned 50 in 2002. BU won, and once again, an unlikely hero, a freshman named Justin Miser, was the MVP choice. Justin Miser was uh, an extremely unlikely hero for, uh, for Boston University uh, this past year. Uh, he had uh, quite clearly struggled offensively. Uh, one of the members of a very uh, highly touted freshman class that came into BU, but uh, Justin's uh, numbers were uh, clearly uh, not what uh, he probably expected them to be. Uh, at that late juncture of the season. But uh, the hero's mantle is always there, ready to be grasped in, uh, grasped in the bean pot, and uh, he happened to be the guy that came up and seized the moment. Time must elapse before these most recent bean pot accomplishments become a part of bean pot lore. But when they do, they will be forever linked to the tradition and emotion of the bean pot, where dreams come true. Those four teams, aren't, they don't lie down for this. This, it, it, you know, it's, it's the most, most people think that those schools, that the hockey season's over, for crying out loud, when the, bean pot, when the bean pot finishes, you know? All the schools are ready to play in the bean pot. There's nobody that, you know, most of the time, uh, they are focused on that game, and they are thinking about, you know, what, you know, the opening night game, or they're thinking about the championship game. They are following so many great student athletes and coaches, and they're a part of history, and they've got a, you know, cherish that moment and really take advantage of it. And when we go out there, put on our best show possible. Everybody just kind of, it's their chance uh, as an institution to hang their hat and, and to scream around the water coolers and the, just to kind of uh, give out a big cheer if, uh, if their team won. And I think that's what makes it, makes it unique. And it's been that way because it's been the same four teams uh, for uh, five decades plus. It's a great motivator for us, and it's very important. You know, our, our, it's funny, our neighbors, we won the national title a few years ago, and they said, you know, that's great, but we want to win a bean pot. And it still is something special to people, and, uh, and that's what makes it so special. You know, it gives everyone a chance to, to, uh, to raise their flag for that year, and uh, despite what ha happens the rest of the season. And, uh, and I think it'll always be that way. I remember Snook saying this was going to be the greatest tournament going way back in 1952. And uh, he, he spoke wonders of it. I think it was just an honor to play in the damn thing, you know? This year will be my 40th straight year of either playing or watching the bean pot. And, you know, it's amazing that not only do I remember that I won one, but a lot of other people do too. And it's a good feeling. If the kid can be in front of that Boston audience and go around holding that pot, that's a dream. Kids will tell you that. They don't forget it. And people don't forget it. They say, geez, you held the pot. It's uh, 
special.